All right. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Lynn Longfield. I'm a retired Presbyterian pastor, currently attending Peace Lutheran Church. And from time to time, I hang out with Quakers. So I'm kind of an ecumenical type, as it turns out. I would like to welcome each of you to the second in a series of four Zoom-based workshops being offered on Native American justice. Tonight, we will be exploring the history and impact of Indian boarding schools. Next month on March 22nd, our subject will be decolonizing the first Thanksgiving. And then at a time yet to be figured out, we will view together Dawnland, which is a documentary about cultural survival and stolen children. This series is being presented by Conversations on Race which is a 12 year cooperative partnership, including the Church of the Indian Fellowship, Trinity Presbyterian, Peace Lutheran, and Tacoma Friends Meeting. Our current chair is Ted Johnstone and Ted's with us here tonight. Over the years, we have sought to deepen our own understanding of racism in ourselves and in our communities, and then to take action towards justice. We're determined to repent of the sin of racism in our past and recognize racism here and now with the goal of learning what living in right relationships with all people can bring us, ourselves, our families, our city, our nation. We've hosted many events for our congregations like pulpit exchanges and theater presentations and after play discussions, storytelling events, blanket exercise activities and workshops like this. We are especially grateful tonight to Associated Ministries because they were willing to partner with us. We we're able to reach so many more people than we would um, among just our own congregations. And many thanks to Sandy Winley for her administrative and technological gifts that she shares with willingness and grace and just smarts. And we're really grateful to you, Sandy, thank you. Before we go any further, here's some housekeeping things that we needed to get covered. One, this will be recorded tonight. You saw that as you entered, I think, which means that this recording will be posted on Associated Ministries website as soon as possible. And then there will also be resources for each workshop posted there as well. Two, we trust that the speaker volume is going to be just fine for you, but if not, please deal with that the best you can on your end of things. And if you can't make it work, maybe send a chat to Sandy and she may be able to help. Three, please use the presenter view when Reverend Irvin Porter begins his presentation, and that way you won't be distracted by watching everyone else, you know, scratch their ear and play with their hair and all that sort of thing. And you can really pay attention to Irvin. And lastly, after Reverend Porter's presentation, you're going to be invited to enter a breakout group. A tab will appear on your screen. You click on that and then voila, you will be in a small breakout group. You'll have an opportunity for conversation and to answer discussion questions. Now let me introduce the presenter for the evening. Reverend Irvin Porter. Reverend Porter is pastor of the Church of the Indian Fellowship, which is situated on Puyallup Tribe of Indians land. Reverend Porter has served that church for 20 years. And he has for the past eight years been the associate for Native American intercultural support for the Presbyterian Church USA which means he serves as a liaison to like 95 native congregations distributed across the US. The Church of the Indian Fellowship was established in 1876 as a Presbyterian mission to the Puyallup people. When Reverend Porter came as pastor, I was the general presbyter of the Presbytery of Olympia, which meant that I had the great privilege of being able to witness the transformative ministry he brought to that congregation which had never had a non-white, let alone Native American pastor before in its history. I got to be part of his ordination, have served for years with him in the Presbytery of Olympia. And I am here to tell you, he has been a huge blessing to us. 
bringing an accurate historical perspective, a strong voice, a deep wisdom, and a profound spirituality that has really enriched all of us. And you're going to see some evidence of that tonight, I'm sure. Irvin is married to Anne Cecile Porter, who is also an ordained Presbyterian minister. She currently serves as a staff chaplain with MultiCare. She's a native of France, as well as a patient and thoughtful woman. And she tried to teach me French once, but I was an abysmal student at that time. And if Anne Cecile, if you are on this call, thank you. Before um, Irvin begins, let's take a moment of prayer. Let's pray. Oh God, call us into a deeper relationship with each other and teach us to be your people for the sake of the world. As we listen tonight, help us to see with new eyes the injustice and oppression in our nation's history. And within the church, call us to have a loving heart that respects and uplifts the humanity and dignity of every person. Open our ears to listen to and learn from the experience of people of color. Open our mouths to speak up about injustice whenever and wherever we see it. Breathe your spirit over us, O oh God, and join each of us with others to work for racial equity and inclusion for all people. Amen. Amen. Irvin, pass it on to you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, that we've served for a long, long time was kind of a scary thing to hear because it doesn't <laughs> seem that long. It just I know. About five years, six years, but yeah. That, nope, long time. Been, thank you very much for being with us. And thank all of you for being here this evening. Um, I'm using a microphone that's sitting in front of me, so I'm hoping that will give me a little bit of a louder, um, uh, that give you a louder, um, hear me better, let's put it that way, that you hear me better. And uh, with all those introductions, I don't need to make my introductions, so we're going to go right in uh, to our PowerPoint. We begin by acknowledging with humility that the land where I am speaking to you from today is the traditional territory of the Puyallup people. The Puyallup, which means generous and welcoming people, are a Coast Salish tribe. They were forcibly relocated onto reservation lands in what is today Tacoma in late 1854 after signing the Treaty of Medicine Creek. Today, they have an enrolled population of 4,000, of whom 2,500 live on the reservation. During the late 19th century, education served as a tool of assimilation for Native American people, preparing, it was hoped, to have them enter American society. With this, it was hoped that they would stop their hunting and gathering lifestyles and that they would settle in one place. What has been referred to as the Indian Wars had ended with most tribes confined to reservations. So began the dependence upon the federal government by these tribes. Schools were sparse and many reservations had no schools for Indian children. The federal government sponsored three separate forms of education for Native Americans from 1879 through 1930. These include industrial vocational boarding schools located outside reservations, vocational boarding schools located on reservations, and day schools on reservations that stressed academic curriculums. Mission schools were a fourth but separate type of school for Indians. And these mission schools 
teachers introduced a few Native Americans into church training. Although each of these types of schooling differed from one another, they shared the aim of leading American students to assimilate into the mainstream of American society. In 1885, there were 114 boarding schools with a total attendance of about 6,000 students. At the same time, there were 86 day schools on reservations that permitted students to live with their families. These day schools enrolled about 2,000 students. By 1895, the number of boarding schools grew to 157, enrolling about 15,000 students, while the number of day schools increased to 125 with about 3,000 students. Beginning with the Indian Civilization Act Fund of March 1819 and the Peace Policy of 1869, the United States together and at the urging of several Christian denominations adopted an Indian boarding school policy specifically to accomplish cultural genocide through the removal and the reprogramming of Native Americans and Alaskan Native children to accomplish the destruction of Native cultures and communities. The stated purpose of this policy was to, quote, kill the Indian and save the man, unquote. It was believed that if they could change Native people's thinking about American culture as one and only way to be a citizen in this country, their children could be the way of changing from tribal culture to American culture. The government could accomplish this because they had the force of law behind their motives. Between 1869 and 1960s, hundreds of thousands of Native American children were removed from their homes, families, and cultures, then placed in boarding schools operated by the federal government and the churches. Though we don't know how many children were taken in total, by 1900, there were 20,000 children in Indian boarding schools. And by 1925, that number had more than tripled to over 60,000. These children were often forcibly removed from their families during this time and taken to schools far from their reservations, sometimes on the other side of the country. The first time they had journeyed so far from their homelands. This map shows all the boarding schools and where they were at at one time or another throughout the US. As you can see, Northeastern Arizona, Oklahoma, and Alaska are where the largest clusters of these schools existed. In those schools, they were punished for speaking their native language, banned from acting in any way that might be seen to represent traditional or cultural practices, stripped of traditional clothing, hair, and personal belongings, and behaviors that reflected their native culture. They suffered physical, sexual, cultural and spiritual abuse. Neglect was also suffered. The needs emotionally and medically were not important to those who only, whose only goal was making these children a reflection of white society and nothing less. They experienced treatment that in many cases constituted torture for any disobedience of the rules. Some schools had jail cells hidden away in basements just in case inspectors showed up. Small handcuffs were discovered by a descendant of a boarding school worker recently to the shock of Native American people. Many of these children never returned home and their fates have yet to be accounted for by the US government. Illness and deaths were never reported to families. Recent discoveries of human remains on the grounds of some boarding school properties tell the gruesome tale of the idea to kill the Indian and save the man. These are members of my family, and I have indicated beneath their pictures the names of the boarding schools that they attended during this period. My maternal great-grandmother, Hattie Enos Nez Perce, attended Chamawa Indian School in Salem, Oregon, 
arriving there about 1883 at the age of 10. And she left when she was 16 years old in 1889. The Nez Perce tribe was more receptive to Christianity and American society, so their children were allowed to return home for summer breaks, while at the other schools, this was not possible at all. My maternal grandfather, Richard Moffat, attended a small country school near the church where our family have attended now since before 1871. His first language was Nez Perce, and they had to teach him English. So he did not attend one of the boarding schools. My mother, Eloise Moffat, attended the local public schools in Kamii. The town was incorporated so white people purchased Nez Perce lands when the reservation was open to settlement in the 1890s. Five generations of my family have attended public schools in that place. My paternal grandparents, Narcissus Porter, who is Pima, and Eliza Juan, who is Papago, attended the Tucson Indian Industrial School, which was operated by the Presbyterian Church. They met there and eventually married. All their children, nine of them, attended that school. And that is where my father, the youngest of their nine, went on to prepare for ministry. My father, Lawrence Porter, went from the Tucson Indian Industrial Boarding School to attend Bible College in Los Angeles and seminary at San Francisco Theological Seminary at San Anselmo, the first in his family to get a higher education. I attended public schools in Phoenix until the eighth grade when a brother and our sister attended, we together attended a boarding school operated by an evangelical Christian church in central Arizona. The stated purpose was to get us a Christian education but we eventually returned to public school in Phoenix in January of 1977, where we graduated. The first of these boarding schools was founded by Richard Pratt, an officer in the US military based in an Indian prison. Richard Pratt would take before and after pictures of indigenous children as they entered and left the schools. These pictures helped his boarding school get government funding because they portrayed the indigenous children assimilating to standard American style and culture. This idea of the boarding school took off and eventually became mandatory by the federal government and breaking this restriction caused severe penalties. Soon government boarding schools started to become more and more widespread as the idea of assimilation grew stronger. However, the boarding schools were not associated with education, such as math and science. They were all about assimilation. Teaching Native American children to read and write, yes, but also how to interact with American culture as farmers, carpenters, servants, maids, seamstresses, or other servant types of workers. They were not trained in law or medicine or any other higher attainable position at that time. The assimilation started as soon as the children arrived. Their names were changed, sometimes using the Bible as a guide. Their hair was cut, both boys and girls. Believing that they carried diseases, they were bathed using lye, which caused the skin to burn. They dressed them like civilized Americans and then assigned them dormitories and chores. Less than half of their day was spent in school. The rest of the time, they were working on the farms to help sustain those boarding schools. Manifest destiny is the philosophy that created a nation. A merging of several social, economic, and political factors helped speed the American West expansion in the 19th century. Mass immigration from Europe had swelled the East Coast to record population numbers, pushing settlement westward. Expansion really boomed with the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, driving both the population and the economy west. 
As the boundaries of America grew, white settlers and advocates of expansion began to voice concerns over what they considered an obstacle to settlement and America's economic and social development. The American Indian tribes living on lands east of the Mississippi bordering white settlements. Native American lands held the promise of economic prosperity to raise cattle, wheat, and corn, and harvest timber and minerals. Eager to take possession of the land, the settlers began to pressure the federal government to acquire the lands from the Indian tribes. To these white settlers, the Indian tribes were standing in the way of progress and of Indian, uh, excuse me, American manifest destiny, God-given blessings. The top painting is called Westward, The Course of Empire, takes its way and is a 20 by 30 foot painting mural displayed behind the Western staircase of the House of Representatives chamber in the United States Capitol building. The bottom 1972 painting by John Gast is entitled American Progress. It's a symbolic representation of manifest destiny. It depicts Columbia a representation of the United States, the angel-like person, leading the civilized community towards the West, heading to California. De uh, different activities of the pioneers are shown, especially the changing forms of transportation. The left side of the painting is deliberately painted darker and shows Native Americans fleeing before the oncoming set settlers, including the buffalo herds. The notion here is that the sunshine of civilization was headed west, and every evil and wrong, Native people, animals who supply Native cultures, were being swept off the scene forever. It was painted to encourage and to help expand westward. Intergenerational trauma. That has been described as cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over a lifespan and across generations, which originates from massive group trauma. That quote from Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart. The impacts of historical trauma are intergenerational and can include the attachment relationship with caregivers, the impact of parenting and family functioning, the association with parental, physical, and mental illness, and the disconnection and alienation from extended family, culture, and society. Intergenerational trauma is defined as trauma that gets passed down from those who directly experience an incident, such as these boarding school experiences onto the following generations. Intergenerational trauma may begin with a traumatic event affecting an individual, traumatic events affecting multiple family members, or collective trauma affecting large communities, cultural, racial, ethnic, or other groups and populations. Compared with all other racial groups, Native American adults are at greater risk of experiencing feelings of psychological distress and more likely to have poorer overall physical and mental health and unmet medical and psychological needs. Suicide rates for Native American adults and youth are higher than the national average, with suicide being the second leading cause of death of Native Americans aged 10 to 34. There are 574 federally recognized tribes in 35 states. And in the last 30 years, more than 1 million American Indians and Alaskan natives have moved to metropolitan areas. About 67%, the highest record number ever recorded. These original inhabitants of the United States have left reservations and other areas, some by choice and some by force.
This change in lifestyle has left many in dire circumstances and poor health. To many in the United States, this population is invisible, leaving an important problem unnoticed. The health of nearly 67% of the nation's 4.1 million self-identified American Indians and Alaskan Natives. It's very difficult to make generalizations about this population, and it's important not to stereotype all Native American people. Still, Native American individuals are reported as having the lowest income, least education, and highest poverty level of any group, minority, or majority in the United States. The current problems facing Native American people may be the result of a legacy of chronic trauma and unresolved grief across nations and generations, passing them on by the European dominant culture. The key feature of historical trauma is that the trauma is transferred to future generations biologically, psychologically, environmentally, and socially, resulting in ongoing trauma across the generations. And much scholarship is being done on this subject. Internalized oppression. When people are oppressed in an ongoing manner for a long time, they come to believe the stereotypes and myths about their own group that are communicated by the dominant group. They accept and teach the negative image of themselves and absorb their inferior status as being deserved, normal, and unavoidable. When the oppressed begin to believe that the inferiority imposed upon them is a natural way of life, they have internalized that oppression. In order to create the nation of the United States on land that was already inhabited, a description of native inferiority was often used and still is, to justify their defeat. By simply depicting Native people as being defeated, conquered, and white invaders as victors, bringing the superior culture, this internalized racism continues to present itself in Native American communities. The continued depiction of Native American people as silly mascots through the demeaning of cultures with painted chicken feathers headdresses and cheerleaders with face paint and faux buckskin outfits. Some athletic teams really don't see the problem. No matter that children are getting the same message that the boarding schools were projecting about their indigenous cultures, that they are stupid, worthless, and not worth keeping. Indifference towards cultural traditions, self-centeredness, and materialistic obsession could all be seen as an adoption of descriptions from the US government or missionaries that emphasize the superior mindset of white culture. Native Americans are forced into a double consciousness, at the same time deprived of past traditions and constantly reminded that those traditions were taken away from them. I myself have met Native American people who despise Native cultural ways and will not allow them to be part of their lives or that of their children. Local peer pressure for Native people living in racist communities contributes to some Native people giving up on their own cultures to just get along and stay out of fights. Internalized racism shouldn't be used to dismiss blame in cases of alcoholism, family violence, and sexual assault, however. The combination of stereotypes about the stoic and savage native, the introduction of physical violence to native communities through requiring children to go to boarding schools, the adoption of white children and white culture to those in power combined to create these types of violence and abuse in American Indian communities, where they have been virtually non-existent before white contact. In the case of alcoholism, especially internalized racism about native inferiority 
creates reliance on white superiority, leading to the creation of ne negative stereotypes. It's difficult to discuss ending violence against Native American women without addressing the intersection of colonialization, internalized oppression and the centuries of genocide and their impact on the lives of Native women and their survival of Native life, families, language, tradition, and culture of Native communities. The abuse of Native women and children can be traced to the introduction of unnatural life ways into Native culture. Native women and Alaskan Native women today are believed to suffer from internalized oppression and how violence gets a pass from centuries of genocide and political violence. Education is an important keystone to self-sufficiency and quality of life. The United States government signed treaties for many centuries with Native Americans agreeing that exchanging the land, giving it up, the federal government will fully operate and fund schools for Native Americans in perpetuity. Since then, the US government has failed to deliver on that promise. No other group of students in America fails to graduate or achieve aptitude at such a lopsided rate as students in Native American communities. Education is very important in Native communities. Since then, all of these things that happened, the failure of Native education systems began in the late 1800s with American Indian boarding schools. And decades later, when Native Americans were granted self-determination rights that extended to education, the quality of their education did not improve. Since then, there have been reports and intergovernmental condemnation regarding the management of state and reservation education, but with insufficient action or correct ability to correct the situation. I myself received an associate degree in an accounting from Haskell Indian Junior College in Lawrence, Kansas, which began as a boarding school in 1884 and is now a university. I received my bachelor's degree in business administration and master's of divinity at the University of Dubuque and Dubuque Theological Seminary in Iowa through scholarships for Native Americans seeking to go into the ministry. Both institutions subsidized my educational goals. While students of every other major ethnic group in this country have made educational progress in the last decade, the advancement of Native American students has remained comparatively flat in comparison. While the gap separating these students from their white peers has widened. Additionally, these students underperform Native students that attend other public schools. In one study of fourth graders, the Bureau of Indian Education students on average scored 22% lower for reading and 14% points lower for math than Native students attending public schools. Only 70% of Native students who started kindergarten will graduate from high school, compared to the national average of 82%. Those attending Bureau of Indian Education schools have an even lower graduation rate of 53%. Only 17% of Native students attend college, as opposed to the national average of 60 while 28% of the general population holds a college degree, only 13% of Native Americans have a college degree. But as these pictures show, dreams do come true, hard work pays off, and futures can be bright for Native Americans who are willing to put in the hard work, the time, the dedication to the goal, but with the cost of having to leave their reservations and their homes once again. <laughs> the troubled past and the fact that there is still a lot of work to be done, 
Some Native American schools are thriving. These schools, along with the help of federal funding and nonprofit organizations, are trying to reserve, uh, reverse the trends by providing a rich, holistic education in a safe environment. The Institute of American Indian Art is a great example. Established in Santa Fe, New Mexico in 1962, the Institute has become an epic epicenter of art, culture, music, history, and research for Native American communities. With a top tier museum and an accredited higher education program, the IAIA is one of the one of a kind and an incredibly important part of the initiative to provide modern quality education to Native Americans for generations to come. The Santa Fe Indian School uniquely reflects federal and state policies, as well as politics. And all Indian Pueblo Council utilizes the Indian Self-Determination Act and Educational Assistance Act was the first Indian organization to contract for the education of their children. Santa Fe Indian School was founded as a federal boarding school. Later, the education amendments and the technical amendments allowed the school to become a tribally controlled, governed by a board of trustees. In 2000, with the signing of the Santa Fe Indian School Act, this land was turned over to be held in trust by the 19 governors of New Mexico uh, tribes. This was allowed the Sa Santa Fe Indian School to build a program based on educational sovereignty, the right and responsibility to educate the Na New Mexico Indian children in a manner that supports their culture and traditional beliefs. The indigenous people of this land have endured through over 530 years of racism, bigotry, persecution, and displacement. But we're still here. We've survived even the ice age. Scholars have determined that our ancestors have been on this continent for over 22,000 years. Yes, there's proof. We've been able to overcome all these things because of the resilience that thrives within us. Our DNA may have intergenerational trauma and internalized oppression in it, but there's also the gift of resilience that our ancestors have passed on to us. A resilience that keeps going, continues even though things don't look good. Determination abides within our soul. Tecumseh. The Shawnee warrior and leader of his people once said, the master of life has appointed this place for us to light our fires and here we shall remain. Our resilience is our hope. It gets us out of bed in the morning when the going gets tough. It gathers all our efforts and our might and our strength together so that we can provide for our families, our communities, and our people. This slide represents the resilience, that hope. When we have, when we have had to remove ourselves from our families and our tribal communities to pursue educational or job opportunities, to do what we have to do, this is our hope. Our religious commitments pull us through all these things and they make all things work together for the good of our creator. There must have been children in those boarding schools who had to remind themselves and their peers that if they survive their ordeals, the trauma of becoming good Americans and good Christians as they were being taught, they would overcome and they would survive to tell their children about these experiences that they would never happen to them. Their resilience was their hope. It kept them going too. It helped them to do the best that they could to learn and to teach the children that while education could help them one day, 
their cultures, their ancient traditions could be preserved and passed on to their grandchildren and their grandchildren to us today. Yes, Native American people have endured, adapted, and moved on. Many of our elders went underground into the secret places to preserve our languages, our customs, our artwork. When you see beadwork or a dancer's regalia at a traditional gathering, always remember that it, were it not for someone's endurance and resilience to preserve those traditions, the world would be poor without them. No amount of abuse at the hands of people who pretend to have the best interests in mind while they beat, abused, and ridiculed those children was able to eliminate the ancient ways of a people appointed in this place by the master of life, whether you call it God, great spirit, or the creator. It's important not just to Native Americans, but to you and for this country that this history be known and taught to the next generations of Americans. This information has been neglected, hidden, and ignored by the educational system in this country since 1776. The only history they wanted you to learn was about the goodness of the first settlers of this land, the sacrifice of those who went west to settle the unknown territories and defeat the vicious Indians. These workshops are being done to help you, help your country know and understand not just the bad and the ugly of this country's treatment of its indigenous people, but to learn so that it will not repeat those things upon others. We think that we are more enlightened. We think that we are more technologically advanced than those in 1776 or in 1863 or even in the 1970s. But are we really? Everyone has a cultural background. Everyone has a history of language, which is not English. Everyone except indigenous peoples of this land came from someplace else. My grandmother was not Native American. Her father's ancestors came uh, from England. Her mother's ancestors came from Norway. There's a saying among Native people today, they tried to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were only 250,000 documented Native American people in this country. There were probably thousands who were not counted for various reasons too. Imagine that, let that sink in. While it's difficult to determine exactly how many natives lived in North America before 1492, estimates range from 3.8 million to 7 million people to a high of 18 million. The guns, steel, and greed of a people reduced those numbers to a mere 250,000 plus. In a matter of 400 years, some ancient civilizations were wiped from the face of the earth forever. Languages exterminated forever. But they didn't know we were seeds. We're still here. We know the conqueror's language and laws and ways and God. But no amount of washing out of mouths of the children for speaking their languages with soap exterminated all our languages. No amount of mistreatment silenced our ancient ways. I've had the privilege to preach to large congregations in white churches and have conducted workshops for the Presbyterian Church with hundreds of participants. Imagine that, a savage Indian sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of a dark-haired, brown-skinned Jew from the tribe of Judah. When people learn that all people are children of the same creator, brothers and sisters, whose DNA tells us that we all once came from the same person thousands and thousands of years ago, when human beings can get beyond their prejudices and live as one, we can find the resilience that should be our hope. We can be the seeds of faith, of peace, 
and be the family of God that he intended for us all to be. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking this time to attend this workshop. And it is my hope that it has benefited you as much as it does for me to share with you tonight. Yakala, I have spoken. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Porter. We deeply appreciate the gift that you have given us this evening. Your accumulated experience, um, your gathered knowledge, um, your wisdom and your insight. And uh, I particularly appreciate um, how you began by giving us perspective um, from your own ancestry and um, uh, helping us to connect with you in a very intimate and meaningful way. So thank you for all of that as well. And, and I guess we sort of had um, two questions sort of, they felt like they were linked. So I'm gonna put them both together and you can decide if you wanna answer both of them or just one of them um, if, if they seem related. But one of them was, I mean, we learned about a lot of the, um, a, a lot of, really crappy things that happened one was how could things have been different other than just not have boarding schools for example but like what could have helped all this not happen and how can education going forward be improved for native americans so those were the questions we came up with it wouldn't have happened had um the outcome of those Indian wars been different. Um, the other thing is that um, it appears from the historical record that the federal government didn't see it coming either. Um, in those treaties, many of those treaties uh, uh, promised health, education, and the welfare of the tribe, that they would look after them. Um, the healthcare, is, uh, is still a cog in that wheel. But um, for instance, in um, Phoenix, uh, the Indian hospital there was built in the early 70s. And I remember it as a brand new building in downtown Phoenix. And then, and there were only Native American people in that, in that hospital, except for the doctors and some of the nurses. But in the early 80s, they started to open it up to uh, welfare recipients because it's a, a public health system facility. And so it looked to Native American people that they were, the federal government was kind of reneging, uh, trying to get out of uh, the health care that they had promised Native people uh, and had been providing for since the 1870s. <clears throat> That's the one thing. Um, so uh, I don't think they saw it coming either. It was all very overwhelming, I think, as you can see. Also, in, in running the boarding schools was very expensive, very expensive for the federal government. And the, the farms that were used to um, feed the students and the people at the and the workers at the boarding schools was necessary uh, part of it. And so what they said is, oh, well, we'll just teach them that we're teaching how to be farmers anyway. So they'll, so they were spending more time um, farming and doing all that work that had to be done than being actually in class and learning math and history and, and science and whatever. So um, the federal government was in a huge pinch uh, when they started those boarding schools. And, and as you saw the numbers, they got worse and worse. Uh, there were more and more kids that were attending these schools nationally. And you saw the map with all the little dots representing uh, pe teachers that had to be paid, bills that had to, you know. So it was costing the U.S. government millions of dollars in those days uh, to do this. And it would just overwhelm them. And they didn't know what to do next. Um, least least 
uh, the least thing that they'd cared about was who was working for them. Uh, many of these schools had pedophiles, criminals, people who were passed on from one boarding school to the next after their atrocities were discovered. Um, they just moved them along. And we we're, were very, uh, reminds us very much of what happened with the uh, Catholic Church, uh, passing on priests who were doing the same type of stuff, uh, just pass them on to the next parish or the next church or whatever, uh, and get them down the road. Uh, that was their solution to the problem. So the federal government wasn't interested in who and vetting, as we say today, those people that were working for them. Um, and that's why, how a lot of this got started. But I think they were, they were overwhelmed. They didn't realize what they were doing. Um, it had, would have been a lot different, yes. Um, fortunately though, like I was telling you in the beginning, many of my relatives that went to some of these schools and some of them who never went to boarding schools but went to day schools on reservations, especially on the Gila River Indian community, the Pima Reservation south of Phoenix, um, they didn't have to go through this kind of thing. Uh, they went to day schools there. They could go home in the evening and all that, just like a public school. Um, and so there was a lot of different um, uh, developments that happened uh, later on in the early 20s and the 40s uh, with uh, educating Native Americans. So. It was a learn. By the time they got it figured out, it was it was over, and Native tribes were going to. They rested the uh, job of educating their children away from the federal government. Uh, some of those schools still exist. There's 73 of them left, but most of them are run uh, by tribes and or conglomerates of tribes. So it is very different. And you heard from the lady that talked about the colleges that are run exclusively by tribes as well. That's very helpful to um, helping Native Americans to, to try to crack that, those numbers that I showed you, that uh, abysmal numbers of Native students uh, getting college careers. Hey, thank you. How about group three? Uh, can, can you hear me? You can. Yes. All right, so I'm, I'm Robin Hogue, and uh, we had wonderful sharing together, wonderful in um, heart to heart, and uh, spent a lot of time on the first question on the atrocities to the boarding school, and what did we feel about that as the American culture. A question we bring for you, uh, Irvin, is, do you see any signs of that give you hope for our country becoming a multicultural society that come that arises out of our discussion of a dominant culture needing to uh, consume and absorb an, um, another culture that is perceived to be a threat in order to have access to the resources that are in the culture. But do you see any signs of hope that you could share with us? Because we felt overwhelmed. Well, it's good to see you, Robin. <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much. Um, I, I think maybe in the last 30 years, uh, more hope than in a long time before that. Um, and wh where I see that is, is that, um, um, more people, and not just in the church, uh, more people in, in the country, the dominant society in this country is listening. Um, there are people, on the other hand, who have said they're being browbeat with all these uh, different uh, racial ethnic groups um, saying it's about time, kind of reminding people of the 60s and that kind of a thing. Not as bad, but the information uh, explosion, if you will, coming out. Um, but people re just really, I mean, when I go to, to Louisville sometimes and I'm in the, the, the Presbyterian headquarters there, and I do have an office there, um, people just walk by and they'll say, can I talk to you a minute? And this has nothing to do about programs or agencies or anything. They want to talk about Native Americans. 
and they have questions and they're sincere and they, you know, I just don't know a lot about it. And if you could recommend me. And so I'd give them a list of resources that they might be able to take a look at and those kinds of things. And then tell them that they can always email me as well. But I see that more and more that people are just genuinely interested in knowing more. They don't know a lot about it. Um, and so that's good. Uh, when we, when Chris Ferguson and I first sat down and we talked about this series, this workshop series, it was the idea that um, this information is really not coming from any place else unless we do something, unless at least here in Tacoma, unless we try to take the bull by the horns and try to do something about it and at least get the information out um, and hope that that those of you who are hearing this and heard the one last uh, the workshop last month will take that information, learn more about the use those resources that we're giving to you and tell other people about it. Tell your church about it. Tell your community groups about it. Um, and that opens up wider um, avenues where people can learn about what's going on, because not knowing about a subject matter doesn't help um, give uh, gain enthusiasm for uh, equality helping others to do better and all those kinds of things um, unfortunately a lot of the um, a lot of things uh, get thrown on the federal government and um, they just don't do such a good especially from the Native American perspective they just don't do a great job of um, managing things um, they were sued uh, successfully um, about 20 years ago uh, because they had lost millions and millions of dollars of Native American people's lease money. The lands that Native Amer some Native Americans own were leased to farmers to farm products on and that kind of a thing. And the money was then given to the federal government, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, to hold for those people uh, that own the land, that own the lease, and then that would be dispersed to those families. But the federal government mismanaged that money to the tune of millions of dollars. And so the, they had to settle because they just didn't know where it was going to end. It, could, it was endless trying to find out where all that money was. That's just an example of how uh, in Native American business, uh, that the government has just not done a very good job of it. So um, outside of that, uh, I think people are doing a better job of it. I know that the Presbyterian Church has been much more. In my work, when I first started working for the Presbyterian Church in 2013, was exclusively with those 97 Native congregations and being a liaison with the National Church and vice versa. Now, Clearly, at least a third of my work is doing workshops like this, uh, giving out information, uh, answering questions, emails, and the like uh, about all of these things, about boarding schools, about the doctrine of discovery, um, about many things. And uh, people want to know, and they're interested to know. And um, it's that, that's a good thing. It's good uh, to be that busy doing those kind of things and informing people. So, so there has been a change, and I've seen that change happen uh, in the last maybe 30 years, I'd say. Um, that was around the time that I was uh, getting ready to leave the world of banking and go into the ministry and felt that um, people just really didn't care about what happened to Native people and all that. I've seen that change because I've seen people genuinely concerned and genuinely want to know more about it. And right off the bat, they'll confess their uh, lack of knowledge about Native American things and all that, but, you know, that just is par for the course in this country. And um, if nobody's going to tell, um, if we Native American people are not willing to tell our story and to share that story, who's going to do it? And so we've seen that. And so um, th there's good things happening. Um, there's, there's a lot of uh, blurred lines between the groups that are trying to also to make things happen for their groups, uh, African-Americans, Hispanic, the Middle Eastern people, the Africans um, who are settling in the United States. 
Um, and we have associates that work with me, my colleagues who do all those groups as well. And um, so I've heard their stories as well and their struggles as well. So um, I am, and I'm encouraged in that, but yeah, there's a lot more to do. There's a lot long road uh, to hoe. Thank you for that question. Group four, what do you have? I'm not sure if we were group four. Well, if you're with a group, that's close enough. <laughs> if, if you're representing a group, oh. why don't you just go ahead with your question? Uh, oh, well, I don't, I don't wanna take it over from group four, but I, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure what group we were, but um, thank you, uh, Reverend Porter. Thank you again for giving such a wonderful and a comprehensive talk about everything I was at the one last month and I, I really enjoyed putting a few pieces together. Um, thank you for doing this. Um, uh, we talked and we had a great conversation in our group also and one the question that we were able to whip together right at the very end after we were having our discussions was had to do with transformation because it seems like um, clearly transformational change is needed and improving the well-being and the opportunities for Native Americans. Um, and we we're just curious about what, what you would say is the biggest transformational change, the most important transformational change that you would like to see happen. I mean, even idealistically, what would it be? Wow. Um, I, I, I see a lot more uh, uh, of tribes taking over their own affairs for themselves, um, making the decisions that they need to make for their particular tribe and their particular groups of people um, where they live. I think that's, that's very important instead of having somebody in Washington, D.C. making all those decisions. Um, they have also been able, I think the tribes have been able to um, do a better job working with their state uh, governments as well, the governors of their states and those things. Uh, probably one of the biggest uh, hot button issues um, is gaming. Um, and so there's um, some states who have quite a bit of that and some who don't have any at all. And so, and the other, there's the myth out there that every Indian tribe has a casino and that's just not true. Um, so there, there's a lot of that, but there are tribes, well, many tribes who have kind of taken the bull by the horns, again, I use that metaphor, uh, that, that, that are doing what they need to do uh, to get things Hello. accomplished for their people. And um, they're being allowed to, to uh, make their own way, as it were. Uh, there's going to be mistakes, there's going to be problems down the road, but uh, they do it uh, knowing, looking ahead, looking forward to uh, where they're trying to, what they're trying to accomplish five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road. Um, the, the, I'm from three different tribes, uh, descended from three different tribes, but the one that I'm enrolled in um, with my siblings is the Gila River Indian community, the Pima tribe in Arizona. Uh, they run their government just like the federal government does. There's a judicial there is a legislative and there's an executive. And all of those positions have to be elected and they're all self-governing. And uh, when, the, when the tribe came into uh, beginning to uh, establish casinos on that property, south of Phoenix there, um, they uh, used their minds to put together what, what they're going to do with regards to that money. And I actually worked on the, uh, for them for a uh, summer of 2000, just before I went into my senior year of, of seminary. And I worked in their economic development department. And I asked them, I said, uh, how come you don't have Walmart out here or Safeway or um, um, Albertsons? You know, people have to go all the way to Chandler or Phoenix to to shop and do all that stuff. And you could put, you got all the room in the world out here to put those things out here. And they said, because we don't want it to look like Phoenix. 
we don't want asphalt all over the place. And people think that we're just living in a desert out here. And that's fine. She said, they said, but it's our land. And we don't want it to look like that. People can travel a few miles to do all that if that's what they want. The other thing is that they've taken those funds and they're, they told me they're treating those casinos like they're going to be gone tomorrow. And what are they going to do with those buildings? What are they going to do with the loss of income? So they have used that money to invest uh, for the future of the tribe. And they have done, we're talking now 30 years that they've been doing this. And they have made some very wise investments, although they will not invest in anything that has anything to do with war implementation or uh, anything like that. So they're very careful in, in their investment portfolio as well. So they have been very, this tribe has been very uh, careful in how they uh, use their future grandchildren's money because that's what it is. And so they have been a model uh, tribe for many of the tribes around the country, uh, including the use of the property that they build on the reservation so that it isn't intrusive of the landscape around it. So you couldn't even tell that that casino was there until you got closer to it because it's built into the ground. Um, they have a different one now that's a high rise, but um, they're, they're very, they're, the state wanted to put a highway through Indian land on the south side of what's called South Mountain there in Phoenix. And the tribe said, no, we, 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 you're going to get millions of dollars and mil all these people are going to travel and stop and want to get a soda or to stop at Starbucks or whatever. And they said, no, they can do that. They, want, they can do that on the other side of the mountain if they want to, but we're not having it out here. And so what they did is the, the local townspeople who live on that south side put it over in their property. The tribe has been very... Um, very responsive and responsible with um, their people's futures. There's not a lot of tribes that do that, um, but this one sure does. And they have also been able to help other tribes to do the same thing. And well, how did you do that? And all that and sharing um, those good stories about what they've done. So, um, so the best thing I think is that the uh, tribes have been taking, taking their futures into their own hands uh, where once before everything was done in Washington, D.C., around some uh, smoke-filled rooms uh, where no Native American people sat. And uh, it's a totally different uh, atmosphere today. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, Reverend Porter. Um, we have just about run out of time. And so I'm going to apologize to those who still had questions in waiting. Um, and uh, say that uh, we just aren't able to get to them all. Um, and we do hope that you appreciated your uh, discussion um, as much as you uh, appreciated uh, hearing from Reverend Porter this evening and hearing from some of your colleagues who put questions this last half hour or so. Um, so with all of that, in order to uh, meet our uh, promise to wrap up around 8.30, um, let's turn back to our um, um, guide for the evening, uh, Lynn Longfield. Thank you, Chris. And thank you all for joining us this evening. I think it was um, a profound blessing for all of us. Thank you, Irvin. You uh, once again have given us so much to think about and pray about and hope for. Remember everyone, there's more to come. Next month, fourth Tuesday, March 22nd, we'll be looking at decolonizing the first Thanksgiving. And then after that, at some point, um, we'll watch Dawnland together and have a discussion about that. If you are registered for this workshop, then you will, as Chris says, you will automatically get an email for the next one. You don't need to re-register. Along with that email will come some reading material and background material so you can prepare if you would like to do that for our next meeting together. And I would ask you to invite friends and family to attend the next workshop. Reading about these issues is great, but they're, um, it's so much better to listen to somebody like Irvin 
who has all the experience and depth and understanding that he does um, teach us. So um, go in peace. And may we all live with the integrity and the faith and the resiliency and the hope that so many Native Americans have shown us, even in the face of trauma and oppression. See you in March, everyone. Good night. <laughs>